Thank you for your introduction, Paul. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So, modern archosaurs um, split into two groups, birds and crocodilians, and these represent different ends of a spectrum of um, respiratory um, performance and also metabolic strategy. So birds are very high performance animals, they have a very derived and highly efficient respiratory system, which lends it very well, themselves very well to um, high metabolic rates and high aerobic capacity, so high capacity for sustained locomotion. Um, whereas crocodilians, on the other hand, have low metabolic rates and this low capacity for sustained locomotion, um, and they have a sort of much more, well, more, but sort of reptilian um, respiratory system. And so if we want to know what, say, the metabolic rate or the aerobic capacity of an extinct archosaur was, then we need to know about um, the respiratory functional performance, which is difficult because the respiratory system doesn't fossilize, lungs don't fossilize. But what does fossilize, of course, are bones. And so um, one of the main focuses of my PhD is looking at the musculoskeletal um, functional morphology of the respiratory system. So what can we learn from the rib cage um, and uh, biomechanics of breathing to tell us about uh, respiratory performance in fossil archosaurs. And so, like I said, focusing on the rib cage um, and focusing particularly on um, this thing called costal aspiration or basically just breathing with your ribs. Um, all amniotes do this, um, we do this, you're hopefully all doing it right now. Um, and also importantly for my questions, birds and crocodilians and dinosaurs all breathe using their rib cage. Um, this is actually a mammal's rib, but um, after anatomy is basically the same in birds and crocs. Um, you've got these two-headed ribs, which join the vertebral column in two different places. Um, and there's three basic ways that um, ribs can move to change the volume of the rib cage um, during breathing. Um, these are um, rather unhelpfully given these like descriptive names, but basically um, so there's bucket handle motion, which is rotation about a eventually oriented axis. Pump handle motion, which is rotation about a um, left-right medial lateral axis, and then caliper motion, which is rotation about a um, anteroposterior axis, sort of going into the screen there. Um, and looking at um, costal aspiration in fossil archosaurs, I decided I wanted to get as much information about living archosaurs as I could, because as we've just heard from Carl's talk, we really need a good understanding of form function relationships in living taxa before you start moving on and trying to make um, assumptions or reconstructions of fossil taxa. And so I decided to start with crocodilians, um, which show lots of interesting th features of their rib cage. So uh, like I said, um, all archosaurs have these two-headed ribs with two articulations to the vertebral column, um, but in crocodilians, you get this shift in the position of the articulation. So um, the diapophysis um, is located on the end of the transverse process of the vertebra, and it stays that way for the whole series. But the second articulation, the parapophysis, starts on the centrum and then jumps up onto the transverse process, which is something that you also see in um, particularly very early fossil archosaurs. Um, and crocodilians also um, have uh, this very actually quite complicated rib cage structure, um, whereby they have each, each rib is split into three bits. And so each rib also have, then has four joints. So you've got um, the joint between the vert these vertebral ribs in red and the vertebral column, a uh, joint between the vertebral ribs and the intermediate ribs, intermediate ribs and sternal ribs, and then finally the sternal ribs and the sternum. So there's actually an awful lot going on here. And if you want to try and make a biome biomechanical model of that, then there are some certain simplifying assumptions you might want to make. So um, first one is that these two-headed ribs should form um, a nice axis of rotation. So if we just go back really quickly, um, they sh there should be a nice hinge-like axis here that the ribs should rotate about. But no one's actually tested that in a living animal. Um, so that was something that we wanted to do. Um, also, these intracostal joints, so the joints um, kind of actually within the rib itself, how mobile are they? And then what's going on at the joint between the ribs and the sternum? How predictable is that motion based on what you know is going on within the rest of the rib cage? And so to do that, we start, went and did um, XROM, which stands for X-ray reconstruction of moving morphology. Um, and what you do is you collect um, X-ray film. This is um, an American alligator breathing right here. And um, you combine that with CT data. So this is the same alligator. 
Um, and prior to your CT and your X-ray film collection, um, you embed these metal markers, these black dots here, um, into the bones of the animal, which you can then track and see on the X-rays. And based on the positions of those markers through time, you can calculate the position of the bones through time and um, produce animations of the skeleton that show you um, how the bones themselves are moving. Um, and so you uh, collect, import the CT data and the track marker positions into um, Autodesk Maya, which is animation software. And then you measure the rotations of the joints and the bones relative to each other using these um, joint coordinate systems. So um, these are, you can align them however you like, but for the purposes of um, my study, I've aligned them using the sort of classic um, alignments that people use when we're talking about ribs. So uh, the blue axis here is um, dorsal ventrally oriented, so that's bucket handle motion. The green axis is anterior posteriorly oriented, so that's caliper motion. And then the red axis is left, right, medial lateral um, oriented, so that's pump handle motion. Um, and joints, joints out between vertebrae and vertebral ribs, sternum and sternal ribs, just shown here. Um, and what do these animations look like? Well, here's one right now. Um, apologies, it's a bit slow, but that's how gators breathe. They don't breathe very quickly. Um, you can't really see much from side view, but hopefully when it switches to dorsal ventral view, you can see a lot more clearly the um, ribs expanding, moving out, and then moving in again. So breathing out, in, breathing out, in, out. Um, so onto my actual results. So like I said, in, in crocodilians, you get this shift in the position of the joints. Um, which is, and if you actually measure the um, anatomical axis of the joint, then um, it's very different um, as you move along the rib cage. And you can use the orientation of this axis to predict how you think the ribs ought to move. And so um, effectively relative proportions of these three kinds of rotation, which is what's shown here on this triangle plot. Um, pretty much all along the rib cage, you ex you, you'd expect a decent amount of pump handle motion because there's always some medial lateral separation of those joints. So there's always a medial lateral component of the axis. Um, but what you see is that you move from a lot of bucket handle motion, so dorsal ventrally oriented axis, to a lot more caliper motion where the axis is oriented more um, anterior posteriorly. I mean, that's what you'd expect to see. What you actually see <laughs> is a little bit more complicated because, it, because isn't it always? Um, so. At the first costal vertebral joint, so in the first ribs, which have um, this dorsal ventrally oriented axis, you see a fair bit of bucket handle motion, which is the blue line here. Um, but you also see this little bit of caliper motion in the green line, which we wouldn't have expected based on purely the anatomy. Um, and also the same is true uh, of the fourth joint. So this is, so, um, this, this is uh, one of these joints after the shift in articulation position. So this joint is really flat. And so you wouldn't expect a lot of um, rotation about any kind of dorsal ventral axis because there's no real component of that to the joint uh, axis. But it's there. It's right there. There it is. Um, so the predictions that we're getting from the anatomy aren't necessarily being borne out from what we're measuring in vivo. Um, and if you take more information, uh, if you go, go, go back to our triangle diagram, so um, for first rib, the fourth rib, and the seventh rib, just as some representatives across the rib cage, um, this is where they plotted out um, on the, based on the anatomical data. But if you then sort of replot it based on the relative proportions of those rotations that you see in vivo, then they plot out in very different places. Um, and they're all actually sort of moving towards the middle and so you get a lot more of, you get all three rotations more equally in vivo, it would seem, than you might expect just based on any kind of, um, any kind of anatomical measurements. And if you try and do sort of linear, but just because there's not a one-to-one -one relationship between morphology and motion doesn't mean there's no relationship between morphology and motion. So we did linear regressions, um, basically of the kind of expected rotations versus the actual rotations. and these are the results for each for like um, pump, caliper, bucket handle motion. Uh, these, well, the dotting hasn't come out very well, but um, these lines here, 
are the lines of identity, so that's where you'd expect a one-to-one -one relationship. As you can see, the actual data is way off from that. Um, but And you can put a line through this data, but there's a heck of a lot of scatter even just between different breaths within the same animal of the same joints. So um, to answer our first question, how you know do the vertebral ribs move in a predictable way based on anatomy? The answer is a big fat no, which is unfortunate when it comes to reconstructing motion fossils because um, the cost of vertebral joint is actually one of the few things that actually fossilizes because both the vertebral ribs and the vertebrae are actually bony. Um, all the rest of it, so the sternum, sternal ribs, intermediate ribs are all cartilaginous and don't, don't tend to fossilize. Um, and moving on to how those joints actually move. So in the first sternocostal joint, um, it's basically mirroring what happens at the cost of a vertebral joint. You've got this big um, bucket handle component about this dorsal ventral axis of a little bit of caliper and a little bit of pump. And that's you know based kind of what we expect if there's not a lot going on at the joints in between. It's basically just mirroring what happens at the top joint. Um, but again, if we move more posteriorly in the rib cage, to again, to again, I've chosen rib four here, um, this is a lot more chaotic. The motions going on um, at the sternum are suddenly a lot less predictable, and partly that's because the motions at the um, costal vertebral joint are a bit more complicated. But at the same time, um, there's a lot going on at the joints within the rib themselves. Um, I've not put the uh, uh, joint coordinate systems on here because it's not necessarily super important how these ribs are moving. The take home message is that these joints move and they move a hell of a lot actually. Um, so there's a heck of a lot of complexity um, going on within rib motion in the alligator rib cage. So how mobile are the intercostal joints? It kind of depends. There's not a lot going on at the front of the rib cage, but they suddenly get a lot more mobile when you go further back. and so how predictable are the rotations at the sternocostal joint? Again, it depends. If there's not a lot going on in the intracostal joint, so at the front of the rib cage, then it basically just mirrors what happens at the costal vertebral joint. Um, but as soon as you move further back in the rib cage, then all bets are off. Thank you, Paul. Um, so I'm just going to quickly talk about some future directions I want to take this work in. Um, all of that recently was published in Journal Experimental Biology, so please feel free to tweet about any of that. This, however, is still ongoing, so Please put Trish away for now. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is get some bird data. I and mean, we've got some bird data, but um, this, this is what the animations look like. They're a little bit wobbly. Um, so I need to still, there's some refinement. I need to do the data, track more markers, get more rigid bodies, um, get some nicer animations, basically. Um, but also what I want to do is try and integrate data from birds and crocodilians together um, and to do that, I've been working on this new scheme of um, homologizing your coordinate systems. So rather than basing how you measure rotation on sort of your external frame of reference, so like up, down, left, right, front, back, um, it's actually based on anatomical landmarks on the ribs and on the vertebrae. Um, so it's kind of like the scheme sort of set here. If you, ah, whoops, uh, if you align one axis going sort of actually along the um, anatomical axis of the joints, and then setting up um, planes based on the landmarks to align your other axes. And then once you've got a homologous system, you can then decide whether or not, okay, well, my dinosaurs may move like this. They may have some kind of crocodilian motion pattern, or they may have a bird motion pattern. Um, which one do I assign them? Or which, sort of what combination do I assign? Um, and to do that, I've been doing some, uh, well, to help decide that, I've been doing some morphometric analysis on birds, crocs, dinosaurs. Um, the dinosaurs pretty much all plot out at the bird end, which is you know, rather hopeful, because birds hopefully um, behave in a much more predictable way biomechanically when they're moving their ribs. And so hopefully one day um, I will be making some morphology move and breathing some life back into some sort of fossils. Um, in conclusion, uh, gator ribs don't move in a simple, predictable way. Um, but to take this really further into the dinosaurs, I'm going to need some more data from birds and um, new ways of integrating data from different taxa. And just to quickly say some thank yous. Uh, my supervisors, Bill, John, and Phil. Um, my collaborators in the US, Beth and Sabine, without whom none of this would have been possible. Um, and thank you all for listening. Any questions? <laughs>